Um, a little bit about the Connecting Communities series. Uh, there's uh, events taking place online and in person all around the Bay, looking at the intersection between transportation, housing, uh, and climate and social equity. And uh, that's what we do at Transform. We're a nonprofit advocacy organization uh, focused on those issues. We've been based in the Bay for 22 years, uh, and we focus on policy advocacy uh, here in the Bay and statewide. We like to say you can't get ahead if you can't get around. And so making those connections um, between how can we solve for climate and equity with transportation and land use solutions. That is what we do. And um, just briefly wanted to acknowledge the financial sponsors of uh, the Connecting Communities series. Forgive me as I pull them up. One of them is the Association for Commuter Transportation of Northern California, so thank you. <laughs> uh, the American Planning Association of Northern California chapter, Commute with Enterprise, who's also well represented here and has been a great partner throughout the series. Uh, EAH Housing, Eden Housing, the San Mateo uh, County Office of Sustainability, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Spare the Air Resource Teams, thank you very much as well and Zikla. Uh, those are our sponsors. And thanks, they can all have a round of applause. We also had over a dozen co-hosting organizations, including the ones co-hosting this event. Uh, and we're really grateful to everyone who participated. Um, quick icebreaker. Who used a bike in some part of your way to get here today? I did. All right, there's a few of us. Who carpooled? Awesome. Who took uh, BART on some part of your trip? I didn't. Uh, who took a train? I took a train. Awesome. Uh, what am I leaving out? Any other ways? Scooters? Oh, bus. How could I forget? Who took a bus? Great. Uh, any scooters or shared mobility? Bike share? Scooting? Couple? Car share? Lovely. Does Ford Transit connect? I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> Whatever you say it does. Whatever you say it does. So um, we have the Spare the Air Resource Teams was one of the organizers of this event. And as you probably heard on the way in, anybody who did not drive by yourself, I won't make you raise your hands if you did that. Uh, but anybody who didn't, what about walking? Did anybody walk to get here? Yes, yes. Excellent. Um, so anybody who just raised your hand uh, should have a little red ticket. And uh, yeah, uh, raise your hand if you need a ticket. If you earned your ticket but did not get it. This is Stephanie Anderson from Spare the Air. Whoever's calling you right now, it can't be that important. <laughs> So we're going to do this drawing uh, right here. And one other thing, our, uh, our sign-in sheet uh, came a little bit late today. So I am just going to pass this around. And if you, if you didn't sign in when you got here, you can just check off your name if you're on the list or add yourself to the end of the list. Because we've got so many different organizations, not just ACT, behind this. We do want to know who's here and uh, that you were here. And again, we're very grateful for that. So I'm going to pass uh, sign in sheet around and you can just again just check your name off or add it to the end of the list um, if you didn't find your name if you signed up online you should be there ready for the drawing Stephanie can I turn it over to you oh wait where's my ticket All right, let's explain what all this commotion is about this morning. Okay, is that your piece of it? No, these are the oh, other half know. of it. You hold your half. Hold your. <laughs> all right, and what's what's the book? What's the book are we holding? Day Revolution. Are we giving the book away too? Yes. Ooh. Okay, we have more prizes. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here <laughs> representing the San Mateo County Spare the Air Resource Team. Uh, anyone who is a member of any Spare the Air resource team, you want to raise your hand real quick and just see how many people are actually, yay, thank you for being here. 
Um, Spare the Air resource teams are part of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District Spare the Air program. The teams develop and implement various projects to help improve local air quality. One of those projects that the San Mateo team does is called the Active Trips Incentive. We want to encourage people to use any mode other than driving alone to get to meetings and events. If you host meetings or events, you can do this too. We will provide these goodies for you. So what we have this morning is uh, when you came in, and if you didn't get one of these, you can catch one on the way out. We have these nice Chico bags that are um, reusable shopping bags. But right now we're going to do a drawing for uh, this lovely tote bag that Manny is holding. Um, and the book, too. We're going to give away the book? Yes. Is that the, oh, cool. That was just added. A late addition to our prizes. <laughs> and not one, but two of these lovely Spare the Air water bottles. These are insulated stainless steel water bottles. So, um, Manny, why don't we put these down, you poor thing. We've got you doing multiple jobs here. Let's do, uh, let's do first the book. Let's do the drawing for the book. And just the last three. Is it 203? 203. 203. Who has 203? All right, here we go. Three revolutions. I don't know where Three this came from. Chris brought it. Steering. Oh, Chris, thank you, Chris, for bringing this book. Chris Lepe, Transform. Yes. There we go. Thank you. All right, and next. This is for the tote bag. 191. 191. 191. All right, so this is a multifunction bag. You can carry it as a backpack. There's a handle inside. It goes any way you like it. So thank, thank you. you so much. And now our water bottles. We're going to do two of these. Two, one, five. Two, one, five. Come on up. There you go. Thank you. And last, certainly not least. 198. 198. All right. Gary, come on up here. So if you are hosting an event or a meeting and you would like to offer an incentive to your attendees to use an alternative to driving alone, um, you can do this. Just see me afterwards and... I'll send you all the information you need. We can provide these Chico bags for you and some of these lovely water bottles for donation for uh, giveaways. All right, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Okay, welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, over the next couple of hours, we'll be talking about how we can use uh, public policy to improve our commute. Um, I, I'm Jessica Alba with Stanford University. Um, I took the train and bike here today. I have my little uh, folding bike over here. Um, so my commute was lovely. Uh, but I'm sure quite a few of us were a bit frustrated as we entered the room, either because of all the distracted dri drivers out there or because it was hard to find parking. I hear that parking was easy to find this morning. Um, but am I right? Any frustration in the room as you entered? A little bit, Stacy, Georgina. Yeah, you spent an hour and a half, an hour and a half to get here. Yeah, yeah. so it happens, right? Um, so let's see if we can get some clarity uh, into what we as passionate individuals and professionals can do uh, to influence our own commute. Um, I am a member of ACT's Public Policy Committee, and that's why I will be moderating today's event. Uh, ACT's NorCal chapter is one of the co-hosting organizations of the, this event. So how many of you are familiar with ACT here? Oh, vast majority, perfect. Um, we have ACT's president, Connie McGee, for, for the national organization here today. Um, Connie Wyden, yeah. Stand up, and we also have uh, lots of ACT NorCal leaders here as well. If you want to stand up too, if you're interested in learning more about the organization, you're more than welcome to reach out to them afterwards. Um, 
I'd also like to give a shout out to our other co-hosts for this event, Prospect Silicon Valley. We have Gary here, if you're interested in talking to him afterwards. Uh, and the Spare the Air resource team, and we have Stephanie here. So fantastic to have all of you so involved in this um, matter. And I want to say, give a big shout out to Transform and for hosting these events as well. Um, how many of you have attended another event in the series? One, two, three, a few, a few of us. Who is planning to attend uh, the upcoming, one of the upcoming couple of events? A few of you? Perfect. If you don't know, if you want to go, check out the website. There's plenty of information. Link is here, and I'm sure you can find it online as well. Um, we'd also like to thank uh, San Jose State University for hosting here at the King Library today. So a big thank you. And now on to today's topic. There's a lot we can do to decrease congestion and improve communities in the Bay Area without necessarily building new expensive roads or infrastructure. So today we'll learn a bit about what's already happening, what's working elsewhere, and what to watch and advocate for um, so commuting gets better um, and not worse in the future. We'll start off with brief presentations. Um, by our three panelists, uh, followed by a moderated discussion between me and the panelists. And then we're saving roughly 15 to 20 minutes uh, of the session for Q&A. So take notes on your phones if you don't have paper and pen, and um, save those questions for the, the audience Q&A at the end. We'll also get a brief recap of ACT's recent and ongoing work in the transportation policy space before we wrap up this morning's event. And with that, I would like to introduce you to our three Bay Area speakers. Um, so why don't we just stand up now and then Peter can come up uh, when we're getting started. So Peter Engel is the Director of Programs at Contra Costa, Contra Costa Transportation Authority. And he will be sharing um, some fun information about measures in the county. And we have Kim Comstock, who is uh, the Commuter Programs Manager for Commute.org, and she will be sharing a bit about uh, carpooling and other programs that Commute.org is working on right now. And then we'll learn about the Palo Alto TMA and an on-demand uh, pilot project with uh, Michelle Poche flaherty who's the City Manager of the City of Palo Alto. But first up, we have Peter Engel, and I will hand the mic over to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having uh, CCTA here today. This is very exciting. Um, so, as Jessica mentioned, my name is Peter Engel. I am the um, Director of Programs with the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. Um, a little bit about us. We're required to do this when we do these presentations. Our board requires us to tell, tell you all who we are. Um, we are a sales, um, transportation sales tax authority. We were formed in the county in 1988 to manage Measure C, which was our first uh, transportation sales tax, half cent sales tax. Um, that was renewed in uh, 2004 by the, by the um, residents, and um, it went into effect in 2009 under Measure J. So we're all, we also serve as the congestion management agency for the county, so that's primarily a planning function here in the Bay Area for our county to help um, try and control, thank you, um, congestion. Uh, Measure C, I already talked about this a little bit, uh, a 20-year um, plan. It was passed by the voters in 1988, and we did a lot of significant um, highway work primarily, although we did have some programs. Um, it's where we started our commute alternative program, and we had funding for buses, um, public transit, and paratransit in the county. Uh, Measure J, we expanded on that a little more. We continued with our commute alternatives. We increased the funding for um, transit and paratransit, but we still built a lot of projects. Um, the fourth bore, the Caldecott Tunnel, was one of those, 
and uh, the extension of BART out to Antioch was another as well as, unfortunately, well, depends on what side of the road you drive on, I guess, the, uh, the um, widening of Highway 4 out to East County to help relieve um, congestion. But again, BART was part of that. Um, what we do, I mentioned this a little bit, we, um, we fund buses, local street improvements, um, pothole fixing, um, pedestrian, bikes, ferries. We, we are funding the operation of the WIDA, new WIDA service between Richmond and San Francisco. Um, we are fully subsidizing that service with, so it's fares and Measure J is paying for that. Um, and WIDA took care of all the capital part of that. We have programs for seniors, people with disabilities, carpool ride share. We have programs for safe transportation for children. We run some yellow school bus type services as well as we do safety programs for kids in schools on how to properly um, fit their bike helmet, how to, how to walk and ride bikes safely within the community. Um, so I was asked to come today to talk a little bit about the public outreach that we have done through our sales tax measures. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump around a little bit here. We, so we had a sales tax measure in 2016, measure X. Um, it almost passed, but not quite. Um, there was a lot of reasons. One of the reasons was it was measure X. So it was, I think, page 35 of the voter pamphlet. Um, and, you know, voter people were just way too done by the time they got to page 35 or whatever it was. But leading up to that, we did a significant amount of outreach to the public. Um, a lot of it was, was web-based. We gave options for people to log on and tell us what their priorities were. We did a pro we had a special website, keepcontracostamoving.net. We gave CC coins, Contra Costa coins to people and asked them how would they invest. You know, if they had these 10 coins, what are their priorities? They could put as many coins as they wanted in one category or they could spread them out. And this gave us a good um, idea of what people were looking for. Of course, we did printed surveys and online surveys to get input. And one of the more successful things we did was telephone town hall. We did, um, we had a significant amount of people that called into these. It was a lot of fun. We, it was almost like a radio program, but it was just over the phone. So um, people, were, people would sign up and then we would call them or it would, the system would automatically call them and they'd be on the line. There were about 45 minutes. We had a panel of elected officials and staff that answered questions and talked a little bit about um, the, the transportation expenditure plan and what we were looking to put into it to get their input. Um, we had staff in the back room that was screening callers and talking to them in advance and finding out what their questions. It, it was really an engaging process and we had a significant number of people call in. We had um, four different telephone town halls in the four different um, subregions of our county. We also created a stakeholder toolkit that could be used by staff and elected officials throughout the county that gave them talking points, social media points, um, stuff for the newspaper, for articles, so that everybody was speaking off the same um, sheet of music, so to speak, so that um, the message was consistent no matter who, who you talk to in the county. <clears throat> This is what we heard, and, and this was primarily for the, the Measure X, the 2016. Um, 5,200 site visits. Um, you can see there are 13, over 1,300 people participate in the telephone town halls, in-person workshops that had 156 people attend. So when we did this, our agency had been um, around for about 20 years. We collected more information from the public in this one effort than we did in the whole previous 20 years combined. So there was a significant amount of public input that went into the process. Um, and, and what this was actually for was for our countywide transportation plan, but that data was then, or that um, information was then used to help develop our transportation expenditure plan. Um, for, for this time around, so we have um, developed a new transportation expenditure plan. We're trying to get it on the March 2020 ballot. Um, our board made a really, really, um, bless them, last minute decision to go on the ballot. 
I know the folks from Transform that are here, Chris and everybody, has been very helpful. Um, they've been at the table with us, and of course, they've they've pushed staff hard because this there's been this really short development time for this TEP, and so we we really did rely on the information we received two years ago, and what we did was we took the TEP from two years ago and really tried to make it transformational. Um, we all realize we can't build our way out of congestion anymore, so we're really trying trying to fund projects that are that are going to make a difference without really knowing what's going to be out there in 20 years, right? We've got a, we've got a 30 year measure that's going forward. Um, and who knows what transportation is going to be like in 30 years. The technology is changing everything. And so we try, we're really trying to build in flexibility in this expenditure plan to um, give us a chance to say, well, you know, we funded this in the past. It's not really working anymore. So we want to shift that money to something new which is difficult because the public gets confused. The public doesn't really know what they're voting on. So we've spent a lot of time and through the advocates in the county, another thing that was great was the advocates all got together and formed a, a consortium. Um, and so we kind of were able to speak to them and they as one voice were able to speak to us with what their concerns were. So what we did with this shortened timeline is we spent a lot of time um, out and about, National Night Out. We went to several National Night Out events. We tried to focus our time on events where there was gonna be a lot of people in the community at these specific, event, specific events so we could, we could go to them. Um, this is just a list of some of the other events that we went to. This is some of the um, marketing and advertising material that we've done. We did a lot of advertising like at BART, a lot of social media. Basically, we we're just trying to get people into the survey. You know, we were, we were asking them to go online, check the survey, you tell us what your priorities are. And then that information was very helpful as we sat down with the advocacy groups to, um, to try and negotiate, you know, the best route here. This is what the public has told us. Um, so how do we mesh what the public wants with what is needed to kind of nudge people. You know, we, we, we need to get people out of their cars. We need to find alternatives. We need to find alternatives that work. Um, but we also have to respect, you know, kind of where people are now and what they're willing to vote for. These are some of the lessons learned. Your agency needs to have a thick skin. You're gonna get a lot of, you're gonna be told a lot of stuff you probably don't wanna hear. You just gotta understand that, um, you know, these are the taxpayers and we gotta listen to them. And, and move forward. Um, we want to reach out to people on the device they use most. If people are on their smartphones all the time, we want to create um, media that, can, that works on their smartphone so that while they're at work or while they're um, in line at Starbucks, they're able to connect and potentially take a survey or something like that. And be as inclusive as possible. Um, the silent majority, um, be aware that you have a silent majority. So, um, you know, sometimes the people that we're trying to trying to get information from, they're just not available. And I think this goes to the public policy part, which is the main part of the discussion today, is we've got a public out there that's very busy. They work hard all day long. They're on a long commute. They get home. They're spending time with their family. They don't have time to, you know, deal with this stuff. They just want it to work. So um, be, aware, be aware of what their needs are, and they may not be the people that are coming to public meetings to speak out or take, take, their, take time to you know, call their legislator or their city council person. They just want to make, they just want it to work for them. So when they get to the, when they get to the ballot box, they're gonna vote on if it's working or if it's not working. So it's very important to in, try and get feedback from as many people as you can and include them, make it fit into their lives, their weight, the, their ability to um, give you their input. And that's all I have. Thank you. We wish you the best of luck in March. Uh, up, yes, that's fantastic. We have, and I'm, Plenty of questions to ask, yes. Kim, are you ready? Kim Comstock with commute.org. What's up at commute.org? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, okay, excellent. Thank you. So I am, commute dot, uh, I am Kim Comstock from commute.org. <laughs> There's more of us than just me. <laughs> it's just, um, just a little bit about myself uh, to start off with is uh, I've been in the TDM or transportation demand management uh, world for about 15 years. I started at Rides for Bay Area Commuters for any old schoolers in the house. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're aware of that. Oh, only two, three, <laughs> four, okay. Um, and then, uh, then moved on to 511 and then fa found a home at commute.org for pretty much the last 13 years. And I've worn many hats at commute.org and the demands um, of our agency have changed over the years as well. And since I've been riding that wave, I've been growing with them myself. I pretty much grew up there. <laughs> I found my husband, got married, had a kid. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's next. I can't wait to retire, actually. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm here today to, to talk to you about commute.org, our programs, and also how we use feedback and engagement for our program development and also services and how valuable it is. And we don't get enough of it, to be honest. So we use everything that we get. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today. So commute.org, we've existed for about 20 years. And we are the transportation management agency for San Mateo County. And um, our focus is to reduce the amount of single occupancy, occupancy vehicles traveling to, from, or through San Mateo County. So pretty much we're just trying to get people in this image from driving alone to get into alternative modes. And we do that through our programs and services. So it is through our rewards, incentives, and education, and information, and engagement with the public. Um, but we are a public agency, and we are considered a joint powers authority. And each city in San Mateo County, or most of them actually, uh, 17 cities in uh, San Mateo County are on our board. They're elected officials, plus also the county uh, supervisors on our board, you know, helping us understand what we should be working on. So at our board meetings, we are talking about what we've done, what we're doing, and what we're about to do. And they are all open to the public for them to engage with us. We're funded by many public agencies as well. So the City County Association of Governments, which is in San Mateo County, very similar to what we heard, um, and also the Air District, um, and the Transportation Authority in San Mateo County funds our agency in general. But we also have, which is interesting for our agency, is that we have public employers that also help contribute to specific programs, in, in specifically our shuttle programs. So, but what are some of the things that we do at commute.org? We do a ton of stuff, and there's only uh, nine of us, and we are trying to get the word out about our programs all the time. Um, over the years, I have seen more attention needed on commuter programs and direct to commuter programs, and that has grown over the last few years. And that's pretty much the role that I'm in now at commute.org, being in charge of the commu commuter programs. But we also have an entire another section which focuses on the employer relationship. But for commuters, um, one of the main things we do is 20, we have 20 first last mile uh, shuttles that connect people from either a BART or Caltrain station to their workplace. And in some cases, we also are serving residents getting to the train station. A few years ago, we are trying to keep up with technology. We adopted the Ride Amigos platform, which is a, our commuter platform we call STAR, which is support, track, and reward. And that's located at my.commute.org. And in that platform, we are pushing more and more as we learn how to use that technology, our incentives, rewards, our challenges, anything to engage with our general commuter. We're, we're sending them to that platform to kind of capture what they're doing and also reward them for their behavior. But one thing that we're very proud of in San Mateo County, which we switched over to um, a little over a year ago, was a guaranteed ride home program for every employee in San Mateo County and every college student. So if they're not covered by their employer, they are covered by us. So we cover uh, four trips a year, up to $60 per trip. So if they use a commute alternative to work or college and they have an emergency, they can come to us and get reimbursed for however they got themselves home. So I think that's a really um, positive thing for our commuters to not worry about how they're going to get home. And they can give those, those alternative modes a try. But for employers, we work with them and say, hey, all these commuter programs that we have, you can use this as your startup 
commuter program or enhance your commuter program. And our employer outreach represents, uh, representatives talks to, talk to them about what their needs are. So here's what we can offer, but what else can we help you with? What do you, what do you need? And they work with them on those needs. And we also help them become compliant with the, the Bay Area Commuter Benefit Ordinance. So if you are an employer with over 50 employees in the Bay Area, you're required to offer a pre-tax commuter benefit or something similar. So our staff works with employers to make sure that they have a, a commuter program and they get registered and get connected with that program. And because a lot of our employers are um, doing such a great job, we try to make sure that they get their acknowledgement um, at, in any place that we can help them. And uh, we have this program, which is the national program that we support, is the best workplace for commuters. So we help them get certified on an annual basis to make sure that they get that recognition. So here are just some images of our programs and all the different logos and all the graphics that we, we work on. But for today's presentation, I did want to dive just a little bit deeper into one of our programs, which is a new program uh, that's currently running. And the example that I'm going to talk about today is our carpool program. So it is um, approximately one year old today, or this week. <laughs> um, we started in late October, and we, uh, this particular example was unique because our funder, the City County Association of Governments, said to commute.org, hey, do you have a creative idea for a carpool program? What do you, what's within your means that you can do uh, for, for our county to encourage more carpooling? And they had a, a specific source of funds, which is the Transportation for Clean Air Fund, or TFCA. And they said, we have these rules that we have to apply by, uh, we have to abide by, and what, do you, what ideas do you have? So carpooling in the 15 years that I've been in the industry has changed dramatically. So we worked really hard on just like these paper match lists and getting people to group together and talk to each other and just uh, carpool together or agree on a time or rules. Nowadays, we have so many amazing apps that are available, such as the Waze Carpool and Scoop. Um, and with, uh, with those dynamic carpool apps that are out there, we wanted to incorporate that in our new carpool program. And so with the help of our provider for our um, commuter platform, Right Amigos, they had a solution. So the Right Amigos platform can connect to those two dynamic carpool apps for easy tracking within our commuter platform, which unlocks our rewards that we want to do for our commuters and our carpoolers. So our Carpool 2.0 program, which is rewarding carpoolers up to $100. And we ask uh, carpoolers to for every 10 days that they track their carpool trips, we will unlock a $25 e-gift card for them. And they can do that up to $100. And uh, we wanted to use our tool and all these different providers that are out there. And that has been a real positive, um, positive uh, reception from commuters to make things easier for them to get their rewards and also for our employers to entice their, their employees to try carpooling. But it wasn't just simply, sure, commute.org, you get this money. Uh, we did have to go around to all of the different CCAG commissions, which there's many, technical advisory, citizens advisory committee, and then the full board to pitch our idea and prove that this is something that's valuable to spend these dollars on. And so I wanted to just clarify, too, the, the source of funds. I thought it was important for this meeting just to say the TFCA dollars. Where did they come from? And how did CCAG have them? And so I thought, I just did a little de digging um, because sometimes you, know, you just get funds and you're happy and you go do your program and you don't really look really where did it begin. So I just thought I'd just show you what I, what I learned was that in 1991, there was a $4 surcharge that was put on all cars and trucks um, in the Air District's jurisdiction. So if you registered your car or truck, you paid a $4 surcharge. That $4 was then sent to the region that, which is the Bay Area Air Quality Management District for us. And then they chose, uh, they, they hold on to 60% of those dollars for their regional efforts um, to fund grant projects that were going to reduce uh, vehicle emissions. And they do their own call for projects, their own regional initiatives. But then 40% get sent down to the individual counties to ch also do the same thing in their particular county. And so for us in San Mateo County, that was our CCAG of San Mateo County. 
And then um, we are a local agency in San Mateo County, so then we were able to pitch an idea and get funding because it met with uh, the rules of the particular fund. And then we have our happy carpoolers. So that $4 that was initially paid finally got to, back to the actual person um, or people to, to help them with their behavior change, be help, help them with getting into a carpool and, and st sticking with it. But how do we get the word out? So it's important, we can do this um, all day long in our offices, but how does the general public, how does the commuter, how does this resident, how does the employee, how do they know about it? And so we try really hard, <laughs> but um, just here's some, some key things that we do. We have to make sure our website has plenty of information about what we're doing, uh, what they can download, uh, if, uh, commonly asked questions, even YouTube videos showing how to do certain things. And we do that internally in our office, <laughs> you know, doing um, helpful tips when we find that there's problems. Um, we have a commuter and an employer e-news. So we have about 20,000 commuters that are in our commuter e-news and about 2,000 employers. So they're getting our information on a monthly basis and we're highlighting our programs, trying to convince them to pass this down to their employees or trying to uh, convince them to try um, a new mode other than driving alone. We, of course, cr uh, create uh, printed material to hand out at events, also to mail to residents or mail to employers. It can be posters, um, postcards, um, easy things like that. And in some cases, we do press events. Uh, Genentech was kind enough to host our Carpool 2.0 event in January, which helped really generate a lot of media buzz around our program. And so we even got some as the bottom here, they're about to talk about our program at, uh, on NBC. So that was pretty exciting to see our program get into the, the media and that's earned media for us. So it was a real big win. But we also do paid advertising. So you'll see us on the Highway 101 billboards or 92. Has anybody seen our advertisements? One, two, yay. <laughs> so we do try uh, in different ways to reach people. And in some cases, some of our partners, such as Waze, they promoted our program within the app, which was really, um, uh, they did, they asked, can we do this? And I was like, yes, you can, you know, let's, <laughs> and hopefully we'll see more of that to drivers, um, you know, so. Uh, and we, and please join our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn accounts, because we're posting on a regular basis. And most currently, it's the most interesting it's ever been. So, but you'll have to go and check it out to see why. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, but a part of all of this, uh, when we hear from the individual commuter, uh, or just a citizen, or resident, or an employer, those, that information is valuable to us because that's our, really our avenue to talk to them. So when we have a survey, whether it's a survey about our Carpool 2.0 program, or it's our shuttle program, um, or challenges, uh, and we get that information back, and especially the comments, wow, th that is, sometimes it's like three pages long, and you have to just sit there and just like read through it, and you highlight some positive things or negative things, and you really learn from that. So when people, so if you ever get a survey from us, please respond, because we need that information. We can't be everywhere all the time, so when we are doing the surveys, that information is valuable when we're thinking about program development. Um, what do we need to change? What are we missing the mark on? Uh, and, you know, what's in our ability? And if there's something outside of our ability, we can share it with our partners. Um, so those one-on-one -on -one conversations with commuters, in addition, at outreach events, are extremely key. The staff here in the off, uh, here uh, we have in the, the room is Rebecca and Cecily. Say hi. So they have been doing tons of outreach events. And so they come back immediately and, and share what they've experienced. And those experiences are really positive. Um, for e even if they're negative, uh, it's like we learn to say, okay, that might be a little difficult of a process, or we, we wish we could do this. Um, and how do we do a workaround for this? And, you know, and then how do we solve that and, um, and make it better next time? And then they also are talking to employers directly about these uh, programs. And so we get to take that back and say, hey, there's a need for this. Um, we have a dedicated support email for this that we're uh, talking to commuters and whoever uses that directly uh, on a regular basis. And just want to say that comments and testimonials are powerful. I've been saying that kind of all along, but they really are. 
um, our recent winner for one of our challenges, um, my coworker was sharing, um, her, her name was Kitty, and she won this vacation package from us, and we were so excited. We were ready to go out and make it like a film crew of like this person winning the our vacation packages with big blow up um, hotel.com gift card and a Southwest gift card, oversized. We wanted to like just make it a big show, and she said no. <laughs> I don't want I don't want a picture taken. I don't want to do anything, you know, and, but you know, it wasn't a part of winning the prize. We just hoped she would want this. But not everybody wants to do that. But we asked, can you give us a testimonial? And the testimonial super powerful. So she shared that she started carpooling when she had her child. And she um, started to carpool but from her daycare provider. So she started to meet her carpool partner at her daycare back and forth and it had become a huge lifesaver for her time wise money wise and less stress and she didn't have to drive and she figured out not the pickup point at her house but a pickup point at uh, something that made more sense which was her daycare provider so we thought like usually we hear when we're doing outreach events the commuter that says no I, I, I can't do that because I have too many family obligations it's true I'm one of those folks too but this was a nice testimonial to say, well, have you thought about a different pickup point or different drop-off point? Uh, think outside the box. So these things are powerful for us to now engage with the public and, and use in our, in our conversations. But I've been talking about the carpool program and pretty much relates to a lot of our programs, but I did want to just give you the results. So these results are a little over, it, it's from last month, um, where I think are about 1750 unique um, users that carpooled and got our reward. But they reported over 3 million miles that were traveled in a carpool and over 155,000 one-way trips that were carpoolers. Um, and we spent $131,000 on the rewards for this program. And with um, thinking about the miles that they're sharing with us, the trips that they're sharing with us, and how much we we're spending, we were able to kind of look at, well, how much was the effective cost for this program? And it turned out to be 84 cents per trip and four cents per mile, which is extremely cheap. <laughs> and the reason why it, the numbers were low is because people were continuing to track and carpool after they got their rewards. And that's a huge win, you know, to get them to continue. And sometimes when you don't have the mechanism to track what they're doing after, then you kind of are just guessing or maybe you survey later and you get a small sampling. And in this case, we have people that have just stayed with us and are continuing to tell us about their commute. But you know, with this particular program, we, we want more people to be in it, and we want more people to take advantage of it, and we want to continue to support carpooling. So we are in the, uh, this particular program is set to expire in December, but it's been successful, even if that, uh, for, for commute.org, this is one of our most successful programs we've ever done. So um, we want more. We want to get more carpoolers engaged. We want to continue to grow that base of carpoolers. We don't want to just lose them and say, okay, we need to find new carpoolers. So we are in conversations uh, to try to see what can carpool 2020 look like for commute.org and our commuters in, in San Mateo County. So we're, we're hoping um, maybe this month we get approval to have something really exciting to help consistently uh, reward our carpoolers, um, not just one and done. Try to keep them um, connected to us, keep them carpooling, and get them prepared to um, get ready for the three plus carpooling coming to San Mateo County very shortly. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kim. Michelle. Let's hear a little bit about the city of Palo Alto and Hi, good morning. So my name is Michelle Poche Flaherty. I am a deputy city manager with the city of Palo Alto and I've been involved in transportation po public policy for almost 30 years. I started out as a congressional staffer to Norm Mineta when he was a congressman and chairman of the Transportation Committee in the House of Representatives, and I worked on getting funding for the Tasman light rail line when it was just a spark in our eyes. Um, and then I went and worked at VTA and did government affairs there and uh, helped try to get the light rail line uh, built. Um, moved on to do a lot of other things. I've been uh, staffed to... Uh, 
a number of different elected officials, so I've done a lot of public policy work, and also worked in a lot of cities and counties uh, as an administrator. And, um, and now I'm really happy to be working in the city of Palo Alto as a deputy city manager, where our mission is not transportation. It's actually a lot of stuff to serve uh, the people who live in Palo Alto and work in Palo Alto and visit Palo Alto. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit, so how does a city government grapple with transportation and traffic and these kinds of things when it's not our primary mission? And where do we fit into this whole picture? And how do we become you know, part of the solution? And how might uh, some of you plug into that? So let me start a little bit with um, the city of Palo Alto. I think most of you know where we are. Halfway between San Jose and San Francisco or thereabouts. Um, about 68, 67,000 residents and about 130,000 jobs. So we're the birthplace of Silicon Valley. We're where the garage is, right, near Stanford. Um, and uh, this data is five years old. So five years ago, the median home price was six, uh, 2.67 million. <laughs> That was five years ago. Um, so you can guess it's a little higher now. And that is for a three-bedroom, two-bath, one-story home, probably an Eichler that was built in the 60s and has had very little remodeling done since. You can pick one of those up for just under $3 million if you want to live in Palo Alto. So um, this, is, this is the community we're serving. And, and this is our job, to serve this community. Um, we're, if, if you look really hard at the picture, you can see we're actually not dark red, we're burgundy uh, <laughs> in this heat map of housing prices in uh, the Bay Area. And so um, who, who lives, who is living in Palo Alto, you ask, right? Who are these people who buy these homes? Well, not all the homes are two, five, or three million. A lot of them are a little more than that, since that's the median. Um, and so some of the folks who live in Palo Alto you may have heard of. Uh, some of the CEOs of some of the biggest companies in Silicon Valley own homes in Palo Alto. And, and why do they choose to live in Palo Alto? Because I would have guessed they'd live in like Atherton or someplace like that, um, Hillsboro, uh, Portola Valley. Uh, but these folks live in Palo Alto. And my theory about that is that in addition to being corporate titans and high tech experts, uh, they're also human beings, and they're human beings with their own lives, and they've got uh, people they love, and they've got a quality of life expectations in their life the same way any of us do, and I think sometimes we forget that, and so quality of life is, is what drives people to choose a home, right? This is when, when I do new employee orientation every month with our new hires, one of the things I talk about is, you know, one of the really cool things about working in local government is our mission is to be stewards of somebody's hometown. And that's a real privilege for us in local government, to be the stewards of somebody's hometown, right? So, so what does that mean for us? What's the, what's the hometown that these folks are hanging out in in Palo Alto? Um, some websites describe it as the number one public school district in California, and California's a pretty large state. So that's a pretty big deal. People want to raise their kids in Palo Alto, and they will uh, do whatever it takes to get into that school district and, and get that zip code. Um, we have, I got I to gotta give a plug for local government services. Um, Palo Alto has extraordinary uh, services for its residents, and we're really proud of them. We've got, it's a great place to raise your family. We have amazing parks, rec programs. We have a children's theater. We have a zoo. We have a, right, it's a, it's a city of 66,000 people, and we have our own little zoo. When I first started working there as a bureaucrat, I was like, all right, so when there's budget cuts time, I know what I'm going to vote for. Like, who needs their own zoo, right? Two, I've been working there two years now, and we're, we're revamping the zoo. And the, the friends of the zoo did a whole bunch of fundraising, which you can do in Palo Alto. You can fundraise in Palo Alto because um, some people can afford to contribute to things. And, um, and so we're revamping the, the children's, uh, the junior zoo. And it's going to be so cool. So I've gone from being the bureaucrat who just got hired by Palo Alto going, why on earth do we need a zoo? Why would tax dollars pay for that too? I can't wait to see the new zoo when it opens. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so cool. We're building like this tree house that the kids can climb in to look down on and learn all about the ecology. It's going to be so cool. So um, we have great stuff in Palo Alto. So it's a cool place to raise a family. Um, 
And we love our trees in Palo Alto. Like, if you cut down a tree in Palo Alto, you will be ridden out of town on a rail. It is the most tree-loving town I have ever known. Um, safe, quiet, tree-lined neighborhoods. This is not the same street. This is a different street. This is not the same street. This is a different street. You go all over Palo Alto, and you see these lovely, quiet, safe, tree-lined streets. And this is what a lot of people want to live in when they move to Palo Alto. You know what they don't want to live in? <laughs> the housing that we all want to see built, <laughs> right? Transit-oriented development, high rises, right? Density. That's not what people are shopping for when they move to Palo Alto. So where does that leave us as policymakers when we're trying to figure out how to grapple with the jobs housing imbalance? Because that's not what these folks are looking for. And these are the folks who are paying their taxes and telling us what to do when we run their city. So we have to think about that, and we have to think thoughtfully about that. Um, the other thing that we love in Palo Alto is our open space. Uh, when you think about the property values in Palo Alto, that heat map I showed you, and yet we've dedicated one-fourth of our property in Palo Alto to open space. It is that important to us, even though the property values are that high. Think about that. Uh, Foothills Park, 1,400 acres. This is a city park. This is not a county park or a regional park. Most city parks are, you know, you've got, got a ball field. and a, This is what the city park looks like in Palo Alto. 15 miles of trails, plus the Baylands, another almost 2,000 acres of property in the Baylands uh, managed by the city of Palo Alto. So Palo Altans are, are loving this ecology, which we're all for, right? Um, and they're loving open space, but, but where does that leave us for solving these difficult challenges in maintaining this quality of life? Um, let's go back to who lives in Palo Alto. Um, I've added some uh, extra bullet points on this version of the slide. Of those 67, 68,000 residents, uh, the demographics reflect a lot of what you see in our high-tech companies in terms of uh, the backgrounds of the folks who live in Palo Alto. Um, we've got folks who have lived there since the 50s and 60s. And back then, Palo Alto was almost all white. Um, so they're still there, and thanks to Prop 13, a lot of their children are going to be taking over their homes. So uh, we're retaining that same demographic uh, as people pass their expensive homes onto their children to keep those Prop 13 uh, tax benefits. And then for the turnover we get, um, we've, we've gone up in um, our 26% Asian uh, has grown in recent years. Again, a reflection of what we see in our high-tech companies. So we're getting some diversity ethnically, uh, but we're not getting a lot of diversity economically in Palo Alto. And um, so what does that mean? That means that um, the folks who are living there who really like those quiet tree-lined streets aren't so excited about that job number growing, right? We have twice as many jobs in Palo Alto as we have residents. So as traffic congestion increases all over the region, the people who live in Palo Alto think, where is all this traffic coming from? Because our residents haven't really increased very much. We're not building a lot of high-density housing in Palo Alto. So where is this traffic coming from? It's not coming from me and my neighbors. It must be coming from those people, those employees who work for these companies, those people. They don't pay taxes here in Palo Alto but they're creating a lot of traffic congestion. So we have tension. We have tension in our community between the residents and the workforce, which is new for me as somebody who's worked in local government in a lot of different cities and counties around the country. Usually in local government, we're really excited about economic development because it brings in revenues to support the, the city services. Um, so it's new for me to work in a community where people are like, yeah, we don't need to attract any more businesses. We, we've got plenty of jobs in this community. We don't need to worry about that. So that's, that's a different way to think uh, for me as a, as a local government person. And it, it creates some real challenges for us when we look at the traffic dynamics in the Bay Area. Uh, some of you may have seen this uh, figure before. It was produced by Joint Venture Silicon Valley in their index. If you're interested in data about the Bay Area, check out Joint Ventures annual index where they publish all of this information every year. It's online on their website. 
Um, and you can see where our commute patterns are here. This shows you how many people are living in one county and working in another county and where our commute patterns are. And they're crazy, right? They're absolute, what are, what are we doing? What are we doing? So look, right, so we have 50,000 people leave San Francisco every day for a job in San Mateo, and over 90,000 people leave every day for a job from their house in San Mateo to a job in San Francisco. If just 50,000 of those San Franciscans would move to San Mateo, and 50,000 of the San Mateans would move to San Francisco and take the other jobs, everything would be fine, right? Like, what are we doing? So, well, of course, the answer is you're not just going to flip, right? Because the home you want may not be near the job you want for quality of life reasons, right? The people who want to live on these tree-lined streets in Palo Alto are not the same as, like, the hipsters who want to be where everything's happening in San Francisco. So at different stages in our lives, we want to live in different places, um, we have different jobs. The other thing we have a tendency to think about when we're working in this public policy arena is we think about people in these big chunks, right? So we look at these charts and we think, well, why don't these people just trade jobs or trade houses? Well, maybe they don't have the same jobs, right? Like, we have this assumption, like, everybody works in tech in Silicon Valley or in the Bay Area. It's not true. It's not true, right? Our baristas are not working in tech industry, right? Our janitors are not working in the tech industry. And what we're coming to terms with in the city of Palo Alto is those service workers are really important to everybody's quality of life and to the success of our local economy, but they can't afford to live in Palo Alto. And as an executive in local government, I have to recruit a workforce to work for the city of Palo Alto and our city of Palo Alto employees can't afford to live in Palo Alto. So we've got these long commutes. I'm a mega commuter, I'm a super commuter, whatever your term of preference is, and I don't even show up on this chart. Palo Alto is the northernmost city in Santa Clara County, right? It's, its vibe is like mid-peninsula, and we talk to everybody in San Mateo County a lot because we're sort of part of that mid-peninsula group, but Palo Alto is the northernmost city in Santa Clara County. I work in Palo Alto. I live in Gilroy, the southernmost city in Santa Clara County. So this chart doesn't even show me because I'm like within my own county, right? Door to door, I'm almost two hours every day, each way. That's, uh, that's my commute. But I do take Caltrans every single day, so I'm not driving. Um, so, so what are we doing and, and what are we going to do about it, right? And it's getting worse. Uh, this is another data point from Joint Venture. Um, shows you, you know, back in the day in the early 90s when I was working for uh, in transportation policy in my early years, I was only spending uh, two weeks of my life in traffic. Now I'm spending three weeks of my life in traffic. So it's changing and it's getting worse. So what are we doing in Palo Alto? This is a picture of um, University Avenue in downtown Palo Alto. We love it. We love our shops. We love our restaurants. We'd love you to come spend your money in our town, please, anytime you'd like. Uh, you can take Caltrain there very easily. Um, but as I said before, uh, what are we doing about the service workers who are going to keep this main street of ours vibrant? And so uh, we've got a very interesting program in our, uh, in our TMA in Palo Alto. The city of Palo Alto has funded the Transportation Management Association. The source of the funds is par parking permit revenue from downtown. Now, we don't have... We don't have um, parking meters yet. So if you're going to park for a half an hour or an hour or two hours, it's still free. But if you're going to park all day, um, you're going to get a permit, and we're going to charge you for that permit. So um, we take that permit uh, revenue, parking permit revenue, and we f use some of it to fund the Palo Alto TMA. And the Palo Alto TMA turns around and provides transit passes to the service workers in downtown Palo Alto. So we are the first program in the nation that does something like this. It is a, a great approach to social equity in our community. And um, here's some portraits of some of the people we serve in Palo Alto, um, people who are working in our local hotels, restaurants, 
places like that who have really long commutes, um, and we want to keep them coming to Palo Alto to support our community. How do we sell a program like this to the voters who pay their tax, tax dollars for city services to s serve th the voters, the residents? How do we justify to them that we're going to take their money and use it to subsidize the transportation of other people? Part of it is, well, you do you want somebody to like make your coffee when you go to Starbucks, right? Like, so some of it's that, but some of it's also what's in it for them. We're getting these people's cars out of the off the road less traffic for you when you go around your to hometown and you can find a parking space because they're not taking all the parking spaces. So we have to grapple with that, that us versus them dynamic, who are these people, these people who have jobs in my town who are getting in my way, and try to make lemonade out of that lemon by saying, okay, we're gonna take the tension between residents and workers and figure out how can we get the residents to support us helping out the workers uh, because what's in it for them. And it creates a win-win for everybody. So I think that's a really exciting example of something that Palo Alto is doing. I also want to tell you really quickly about um, a demonstration project from the Federal Transit Administration that we've been involved with. And we're partnering with a lot of folks in, in this room on this, Prospect Silicon Valley, Spur, um, and then um, the cities of Mountain View, Menlo Park, and Cupertino have joined us in this. And the FTA has this thing called a Sandbox Grants program and the idea is you get to play in the sandbox and try something new and see if it works. And they give us a little bit of money to try something out and see whether it works or not. And our program has five parts to it. I promise I'm not going to give you a dissertation on each box. I'm just going to fly over the highlights on this. The first part is something called Enterprise Commute Trip Reduction. We wanted to be more like commute.org because we think what you guys are doing is really cool. So we want to be like you. So we try. We wanted to try out this Riot Amigo stuff you were just hearing about and, um, and try it for some of our city employees. So we're making this available to Palo Alto city employees, Mountain View city employees, Cupertino city employees, Menlo Park city employees. I already get it because they're in San Mateo County. Um, and uh, the cool, as, as you already heard about this, some of the stuff that's been cool is um, not only do you, does it help with trip planning and organizing that stuff, but it's got this gamification. And we're trying to see if that stimulates people into being more inclined to use transit than they otherwise would. Um, the second component of it is something we call the commuter wallet. And the idea there is to use some software technology to make it easier to pay once across all these different systems. And OK, can I just tell you, like 30 years ago, when I first started working on transportation, public policy, um, MTC said they were going to make one transit pass for the whole Bay Area. right? And I moved away to like I lived in Maryland and Nevada. And, did, and then I came back. I'm like, wow, you guys are still working on this. It is not easy. And that's not a criticism of MTC. This is super hard to do. So we were like, OK, if you can't get one pass, can you get one wallet that talks to all the passes? And so we volunteered to try to grapple with that. And we're like, yeah, no, that's not working. It's way harder than you think it is, because when you start talking about holding on to somebody's money, it makes it really hard. So um, you know, as things like Apple Pay and Google Pay evolve and things like that, maybe we can move toward that. But it's, it's pretty tricky uh, to do this. But one of the things that's tempting about this is um, starting by doing it through employers. So if you can create a wallet where the employer is giving employer benefits to employees, and okay, I'm gonna give every employee this much money to not drive their own car, and they can use it for a Caltrain pass, or a, a Dumbarton Bridge Express, or they can use it to pay for their carpooling, or whatever it is. If we can work this out so that the employer, the, the employee benefits go into this wallet and then gets get delivered so that it's one-stop shopping for the employee. That's part of what we're playing with in this sandbox, is trying to figure out. And what we found in Palo Alto is half of it is just finding one place to tell the employees what their benefits are because they're not going to find it at the bottom of the HR website in our clunky city employee in, you know, web page that nobody uses. But they will look at it on their phone, right? So that's what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out how to integrate employee benefit information with the funding for these services when your employer pays for them. So we're playing around with that with the FTA and trying to come up with new ways to, to break it and fix it. 
Um, another piece that we played around with is this idea of fee bait or cash out. Who here knows what these terms mean? Okay, so this is the, those of us who have drank the Kool-Aid, and I think almost everybody in this room is with me, is with me and has drunk the Kool-Aid, uh, we want to move everybody out of their single occupancy vehicles. And, um, and the idea is, why on earth are we subsidizing parking in the United States if we don't want people to drive, right? And the answer is because we always have. And it's really hard to take things away that everybody's always had when we're dealing with public policy. So um, my friend Steve Rainey from the Palo Alto TMA gave me this great statistic. 91% of the 120 million U.S. commuters get free parking at work, and 80% of them are single occupancy vehicle drivers. Gee, do you think there's a, there's a causation behind that correlation? So um, the question is, do you, you know, how do we monetize these parking spaces? And the the... Those of us who've drunk the Kool-Aid say, well, we should be charging employees for parking. Stop giving it away for free, right? All right, so let's go back to my job is to manage the city of Palo Alto, and we need employees to provide city services. And it's really hard to recruit and retain employees when they all have these really long commutes. Because again, remember, none of our employees can afford to, not none, there's like five people who live in Palo Alto who work for the city. But the other 995 do not. So um, all of our employees who come to work every day in the city of Palo Alto who are driving, are driving past a whole bunch of other cities that have the same jobs available, right? because you have the same types of jobs in every city government. So they're working, they can get a job in any of those cities. They don't have to keep working for Palo Alto. So how do I attract and retain employees? Being the first city to start saying, we're not gonna give you a free parking space isn't gonna work. It's, it's impossible for us in terms of employee attraction and retention. So we're not ready to go there yet. But what could we do? Could we, do, could we flip that around and say, okay, we're not gonna charge you for your parking space, but if you're willing to give up your parking space, can we give you that cash? Okay, so that's, that's one of the things we're playing with there. Um, we've looked at gap filling, and uh, the city of Menlo Park in this project is um, providing scooters uh, on loan to employees. Uh, we did something a little less progressive in Palo Alto because we needed to start small. We said, if, we know you don't like to ride transit, but if we pay for your parking at the Caltrain station, will you then ride the Caltrain? And we already give our employees Caltrain passes for free, and a lot of them still won't ride Caltrain. So, okay, how about if we pick up your parking? Will that, mo will that move the needle? We recognize that people are still getting in a car and turning on the engine and making some pollution, but it's, at least it's getting some cars off part of the road. Baby steps. Um, and the last part of our project is to look for solutions in the data as we study what we're doing in this sandbox. So at the end of all of this, the idea is, what do we do with all of this research and these new things we learn? We want to use this to change the world. And we want uh, you to be a part of that in the uh, organizations that you're involved with and the reason that brought you here today. So during Q&A, um, I'd be happy to talk more about my suggestions if you're interested in how to be effective in trying to influence public policy. Um, as I said, I've worked in public policy for close to 30 years, and I've seen a lot of things succeed and a lot of things fail. So if we have questions during Q&A about how to be effective advocates, I'd be happy to take questions on that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Kim and Peter, do you want to come join us up here? We're going to uh, take a few minutes just for internal discussion or discussion here among us and then we'll open it up to questions and can you guys see us and hear us back here if you want to come up a little bit okay good Gary says it's okay good uh, thank you so much for great presentations uh, it's a good um, mix of yes we're good it's good mix of measures right and Peter if we start with you and thinking forward to March 2020, so we have a few months, and we talked about the importance of uh, using, of trying to reach people with their personal devices and their favorite devices. Um, what other methods are you ex ex excited about introducing here over the next couple of months to get people to come out and vote? How do you expect you know, or anticipate getting voter turnout? It's in measure X? Yeah, so 
hopefully it won't be Measure X. <laughs> um, and as well, later this month, when the Board of Supervisors um, approves to put it on the ballot, I can't talk about this because as a public agency, we cannot, you know, promote vote or we could promote voting. We just can't promote how people vote. So um, at that point, it'll become a campaign issue. And um, our job will be to inform the public as to exactly what's in the measure and what that means, just the facts, um, and, and not provide any influence either way. But we do, uh, we are preparing for that mm -hmm. through, um, you know, in, in, in a lot of the ways it's, um, it's, it's face to face, it's through meetings that we'll be present at and just explain um, the facts of what's in the transportation expenditure plan, um, what it means if you, um, you know, vote yes and the funding is there and how the funding will be used in the process. Um, but we have to leave it up to the campaign team to kind of, you know, do the actual promotion, the yes, the no, the whatever. Yeah. So. That's great. Um, Kim, uh, I love the, um, the reference to the mom who decided to start carpooling from daycare. Um, are there other exciting um, points of feedback that you have received that have had a big impact on how you reach out to people and the messages that you convey? I would say that in particular with the carpool program, some of the comments about uh, folks that have already got their $100, uh, several of them were saying that I use this to get and convert some of my coworkers I tease them that they can earn more money, they can get this money. And so that theme had come out of the survey that I wasn't asking them for, but it came out where we saw that commuters were using this to their advantage to find other commuters, mainly in their work site or to their friends. And so right there was, to me, like magic. When you have peer-to-peer -peer talking about your program and re using it, um, how do we continue to nurture uh, that particular outreach and uh, uh, what's happening out there? Um, so for, for me, that was a takeaway of we need to do something on a regular basis, not just a one-time only incentive. And so how do we go, how do we move forward out of this always just one-time only incentive to encourage carpooling? Um, how do we, um, uh, where we're, we've now flagged them as carpool champions. How do we keep these carpool champions engaged with us? Because they're out there uh, telling the stories um, about how easy it is to use this app, how easy it is, uh, or what the differences are. They're doing it for us. So for me, I want to find ways to support that, and, and we're working on that. Uh, and Michelle, um, working in a complex city like city of Palo Alto, um, how are you, with the TMA, um, what's the public engagement approach or how do, how do you use the TMA to either engage people or receive feedback from people uh, within, within, within that framework? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting model because usually when we think about transportation demand management programs, we're thinking about doing it through large employers. And so in, in our, our downtown program, it's actually the opposite of that. It's, you know, it's the five people who work at this restaurant and the three people who work here. So it's really high touch, mm -hmm. uh, which means it's not really efficient but it's really effective for a community of our size. So that high touch requires a lot of outreach. So our TMA staff who are here today, thank you very much. Uh, Justine is uh, one of our heroes who goes out there and talks to people uh, human to human and talks about, you know, what can we do to make your trip work for you? And uh, we see that sometimes with TDM coordinators at large employers, but it's really different when you're going out into a community and you're not, both employed by the same uh, place. And our, T our TMA staff are out there really sort of knocking on doors and um, trying to bring the word of transit uh, yeah. to our service workers. And what some of the stuff we're finding in that engagement is really informative to mm -hmm. public policy. 
Uh, because I, again, I think when you're dealing with a large employer who's doing TDM work, it's like, well, they all come in between, you know, seven and nine, and they all leave between three and six. Well, that's not how the service industry works at all. So we've got folks who are, you know, not just dealing with daycare drop-offs, they're dealing with, I've got to go to my other job, and I've got to go to class. And so it's not a morning commute in and an evening commute home. It's I've got all these different places I've got to get to during the day, and how do we make transit work for those employees? So that engagement becomes really important there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so beyond the measure in Contra Costa County, we have, similar to commute.org, we have our 511 Contra Costa program. Mm -hmm. And what we found is a, is a great tool for us is SurveyMonkey. Mm -hmm. We've, over the years, we've developed a long list of folks that are part of, you know, our, our organization from a commute perspective. They're out there all the time. So if we as a team come up with an idea, then we'll do a real quick, you know, four or five question survey that we shoot out to people to get feedback. Um, and see if it's something we think is worth pursuing or maybe go a different direction based on, you know, what the commuters are telling us. Yeah, that seems to be a, a recurring theme here that using surveys to collect the feedback um, and then also focusing on uh, personal devices uh, for outreach and for these mini surveys that are fast and efficient. Um, are there any other um, highlights or in regards to outreach that you want to make here? Um, how, how do we reach um, populations that don't speak English? Um, is that some, I can imagine for um, a, a big region and, and for the city of Palo Alto that this is something that is on your minds. Um, um, do you provide a lot of materials in, in other languages? It's a great question, um, and it has been a concern for us with our, our TMA program in particular. Um, in, in the service worker demographic, we have much bigger diversity than you might have in some other TDM programs. And one of our first things is, okay, so there's this form you need to fill out so we can give you your transit benefits. Well, where's this form going to go, and who's going to get this documentation about me and who I am? And... Um, you know, is this going to come back to bite me? Mm -hmm. What kind of confidentiality and protections do I have? So it's it's particularly because we're not their employer. So one of the things we're doing is um, also trying to work through a manager who can talk with their employees about, okay, I can help you with this. We can make this safe. So some of it is about surveys. Some of it's about online surveys. But some of it is really the human connection and who do I trust and, and who can who can communicate with me. Um, so some of it's face-to-face -face from our TMA staff and some of it's working through that that floor supervisor mm -hmm. at the at the retail place um, who is the connection to these folks for us. Yeah. Which is really different than a big corporate office. Yeah. I do agree with that with employers and whoever the staff it are. Um, for us to have an employer s either send out our survey to their staff or to send out our message, that's an endorsement from the employer, and the employee is more likely to take it or use the program. And uh, in depending on the program and the outreach, uh, we'll translate materials into other languages. But I would have to say, with our shuttle department, they have to do they have to work a little bit harder with uh, multiple languages. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, companies, say in Brisbane, that are warehouse uh, warehouses or different um, different uh, types of industry that have just different languages, really various languages that are coming uh, that need to when we need to hear their feedback on the shuttle service because we are bringing them from the transit station to their workplace, mm -hmm. and so we have um, done translated into paper surveys. Um, but also that key employer on site or supervisor at times is just filling out the, you know, having them come in and fi they're filling out the survey and then we're collecting the paper surveys to be able to capture their, their voice. And sometimes it's just anonymous, their opinions versus it having their name on it or using, which we use SurveyMonkey a lot as well, but in this case it would be more of a printed um, in conversation between the uh, supervisor and the staff. Yeah. So we're... We're talking about, and we'll probably do a pilot with a program, and if anybody has any information that they can provide to us on how to do this, would be great, is taking some of our funding and providing it to a, a nonprofit center or something within a disadvantaged community that already has that network in place. 
um, we're, we're seeing so many challenges that we really want to try and implement, whether it's, um, you know, shared bike share programs or scooter shares or electric vehicles or, um, you know, getting people to BART through ride share programs or whatever. Um, and we think the best way to do that outreach is, is through the community itself. And so provide a certain level of money to a nonprofit that already has those networks in place and help train them on what the transportation network is and how it works and what other opportunities are there for folks to take advantage of to improve their transportation. Yeah, and that's, I think that's a great segue into your questions here. Um, who has the first question? Yes. It's usually the employer who's buying permits for workers. Um, and then we have other instances where that's not happening and workers are doing, you know, the, we have two hour and three hour parking that's, as I said, we don't have um, uh, paid, par we don't have, um, can't say the word, meters, thank you. Um, I, we don't have meters yet. Uh, and so um, so we have some employees who are working downtown who are, you know, they park for two hours and then they've got to leave their station to go move their car every two or three hours depending on what zone they're parked in, which is crazy and not how the system is designed to work. So we recognize we have some flaws. <laughs> oh, is it smaller employers? Mostly yeah, the larger employers are, are, are buying permits. The smaller employers are struggling with how to make it work. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Carrie? I was just curious with both of you. you all of you talked about testimonial um, information and then maybe a more formal process for feedback. And I, I'm just curious, is is there any like evaluation of like, um, like an informal testimony like how do you bolster within your own organization saying, well, I received a, a letter that goes into the record of like this company supporting this project. But then I heard on the street from these three people about their opinion on this project. How do you weigh the feedback? Do you, I mean, do you ever have your elected officials saying, well, I got this letter and this is what I'm going with. You know, how do you, present that information to those who are making those decisions, you know, is there an equal value to the, to the feedback, you know, um, so I'm just kind of curious what your experience has been in those, your organizations. Sure. Um, in, I can say in local government, uh, we get input a lot of different ways. Um, emails to our elected body are very popular, you know, much more than... 20 years ago uh, and so that's and then there's you know public testimony at city council meetings too and then um, at the staff level we'll grab that anecdotal information that you're describing as well as the statistical data right so if we have a survey we've got numbers and charts and those are great but then we also have those anecdotal stories that paint a picture and we try to incorporate both of those and so as staff we try to give a megaphone uh, figuratively speaking, to those anecdotal stories when we think they're representative of what we're seeing. But the council is doing the same thing. The council, is, every council member is combining, okay, I got, you know, 40 emails on this topic, but, you know, my friend told me that her daughter, da 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 da, -da and that really matters to them as policymakers. That sticks. So there isn't one magic bullet, and I think that the last thing I'll say about this is um, the technology is out there to do better statistical data, but the gathering of the data and the cleaning of the data and the analysis of the data all takes staff expertise um, that... Uh, and time. Yeah, that you know most public agencies aren't staffed for and resourced for. And so as the private sector gets better and better with dashboarding and statistics and metrics and KPIs, I think the public sector is lagging behind that, not from a lack of rigor, but a lack of resources um, and infrastructure. And you know we, we don't buy new software very often in, in the public sector, so it's, it's slow going for us. I think for us, I'll echo uh, what you had said where 
um, a lot of the comments that we're getting also match kind of the trends of our surveys. So I think the outliers that are that do say something that's not represented on our survey uh, results, um, you, you make note of them, um, but it's not going to drive a program change or, or, or new service. Um, yeah, I think the, sa this, the same that has been said. We, I mean, we as staff take, you know, the public comments very seriously in their and their testimonials that we get on our web page and and when we have our board meetings especially during the process we're going through with the TEP we are always telling our board what we've heard and giving them a, in a presentation because we know most people aren't going to take the time to go to the meeting and and speak up so we we think it's really important from staff to really relay the information that we're hearing yeah i it, one um is anyone in this room familiar with VOCA, V-O-C-A? So if you live in Redwood City or San, San Carlos, there's a, a local nonprofit that weekly sends out a question that is on each city's um, um, city council agenda or something related to a big issue uh, in the area. And um, this organization collects roughly a thousand responses each week. Um, on this topic, and it's fantastic to see the comments. So it's an easy vote. You you get five options, for instance, in in, in regards to the issue, and you pick the option that is m most um, s consistent with what your belief is, and and then he, this person presents at the the city of San Carlos and city of Redwood City city council meetings, um, and including comments so that the the city staff gets really in, information and it's something to just keep just look up it's voca um that's um both both for good and bad it's uh, but it's through text messages and and so yeah very successful effort any other questions in the audience yep stacy um but, well the, the first thing is just in general is there um i'm kind of all, all of the um, is there a chart somewhere that shows all of the agencies and the money and whatever activities are going on because it's um, simply dizzying? Um, and I don't know how much of it is overlapping um, uh, or should be shared or redundant or whatever. And I have this unique ability right now to flit around to all these different things, and I'm just like, oh, oh my God. You know. um, so if you know about that, and then the other one is for Michelle. Um, when can we have bike share in Palo Alto? <laughs> because every time I get off that Caltrain, you know, it's like I have to take, you know, I live in San Francisco, and I have to take, if I leave San Francisco, I have to take my bike with me. And that's you know an extra barrier to me taking transit and whatever. And the number of times that I show up in towns and I'm like, are you guys just telling me to take a car? Is this what it is? It's like it should be easy. It should be effortless. It should be seamless. Um, I, yeah. Well, can you have bike share? <laughs> Start by Michelle okay. and bike share. So. Yeah, we're working on it. Um, bike share is a tricky one. Um, a couple of the companies came to the city uh, to talk about getting permitted, and then things got put on hold, first by the city, then by the companies. Uh, then we've seen a lot of the companies recede in terms of bikes and shift their focus really to scooters as a, as a much more viable um business model and um, and we're working on the permitting process for that and Palo Alto is one of the slower communities to get to this in part because our residents have been watching what's been happening in some of the communities that got there quickly and some of the backlash that occurred in terms of concerns around safety uh, for the riders and safety for the non-riders. And, um, and we have a lot of very vocal residents in Palo Alto who are worried about tripping on scooters and things like that. So um, our public policy makers really want it to be well vetted and thoughtful. And I think uh, the companies want to make sure that it comes off successfully and um, doesn't suffer from backlash. So I think everybody's trying to see how we can do this 
in a way that works for everybody in Palo Alto. So the short answer is we're working on it. Yeah. So tell the people that are vocal about the issues of tripping hazards and such that um, I'd like to breathe and for my children to have a world to grow up in and the cars that they are um, obviously owners of and have a pension for are the things that are actually hurting and killing people, not the scooters. Or the <laughs> so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to um, speak to one of the bullets I had on my last slide about um, I, I'm going to lobby you guys on effective advocacy. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll share a brief story from something that just happened this past week in Palo Alto. So on Monday night, um, we had a three-hour discussion around um, how quickly we should be mandating all electrification in new building construction. And the environmental community did a really nice job of um, encouraging the council to go beyond the staff recommendation and make it happen faster than the staff recommendation. And um, what impressed me so much is we had over 20 speakers who um, voiced that environmental encouragement to the council, and not one of them beat up my staff for not going far enough in the staff recommendation. No one said, you guys don't get it. You guys aren't doing enough. You don't care enough. You're evil. And you, we're pretty used to hearing that. And um, and they all said, we appreciate all the work staff's put into this. We appreciate all of the, uh, the thoughtfulness. We just think you should do more and sooner. And here's why. Because, you know, and then they talked about all the really compelling public policy reasons why. And it was a wonderful example of civility at a time when I think our whole country is really focused on telling the other side how wrong they are and how right I am and you should just do the right thing and listen to me and you're a jerk and an idiot. And uh, we hear a lot of that at city council week after week about you know how many people are idiots and how right uh, the speaker is. And it, it's hard. It's hard to live in that day in and day out. And so I would encourage you when you want to be an effective, persuasive advocate you're absolutely right to be as angry and frustrated with people who aren't doing the right thing, but yelling at the council or the decision makers about how wrong they are is not a, an, an often a very effective persuasive tactic. So to be persuasive, I would encourage you to encourage positive behavior, reward positive behavior, applaud positive behavior, and make it easy for people to do the right thing by teeing them up for success rather than focusing on what they don't get. I think focusing on what we're all in this together about is a way to get let, get that tide to lift all boats. So if we can all keep focusing on the wins, I think we're gonna be much more effective uh, advocates. Great. And just to focus the discussion on, on what can we do um, as, as individuals, are there organizations uh, that you um, that collect information that is valuable, um, and um, how, how do we find out what's going on in our neighborhoods and districts and the region? I think let's focus on that and then wrap it up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to real quick follow up on what Michelle said. I think, um, and and the beauty of some of the advocacy groups now is that they can they can take that message um, to the city councils. But don't just show up at a city council meeting, you know, once a month or once a year and complain. Engage with the elected officials mm -hmm. year around and understand what their position is and, you know, work in a civil way to, to help educate them as the way things need to be. And then your voice will be heard a lot more when you have to go to that city council meeting. You, you, will, you have earned their respect throughout that period of engaging with them offline so that when it comes to a city council meeting or a board of supervisors meeting, that message carries a lot more weight. I can switch gears to what you were mentioning about finding resources mm -hmm. and what's happening. I and oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, So I agree with you. Uh, it's really difficult to keep track of all the projects that are related to TDM um, that are happening in the county, in the region, um, even the state. So it's. Uh, there is not one place. 
Um, I will say that uh, I, on an active basis, am trying to keep track of when I do hear about certain meetings or groups that are forming, and we try to um, make sure we go and listen to what's happening. But what I have, uh, what I personally do is when I'm hearing about agencies or groups that are forming, um, lots of times there are websites, and on the website there's either sometimes presentations that have already been done. Um, for example, like commute.orgs, our like work plan is there, our annual report's there, and then so the annual report will show the pie chart of like all the funders that will fund us, and then you can go from there to say, okay, where's, where's these funds from, and who's, um, who's in control of those. Um, you know, uh, people who fund our agency are pretty common around the Bay Area, funding a lot of transportation projects. Um, but depending on what county you care about, uh, also looking at the, the City County Association of Governments for, say, San Mateo County, if you go to their website, it's just uh, a really full calendar of all the different projects uh, that they're working on that are transportation related. So there's just a lot going on. But I do want to uh, plug uh, Steve Rainey over there in the corner because you created this um, ecosystem of mobility a while ago, and it was like a Google Doc you shared. And I'm not sure if you've kept that updated, but I refer back to that quite often because it's uh, a confusing kind of world of all the different vendors that are out there. So um, besides who's funding these projects and who's doing it, it's also who are the uh, um, uh, the services that are are you know, start that started and then ended, and now it's a new one. Now they're gone. Now they're here. You know, so it's really hard to keep track. But, but I don't. Yeah. 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 There's so many that have gone, but uh, he. Yes. Yes. And that's what you tried to start many years ago with uh, people contributing to that Google Doc to say, keeping track of all the service providers that were providing these mobility options. Yeah. <laughs> You're not volunteering? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. OK, so thank you so much. I want to just wrap up with a few points that, as an individual, and it, most of you, I assume, are passionate individuals as well, to stay informed by subscribing to your city and county and transit agency and regional agency events. MTC is working on the Horizon Project right now, or Plan Bay Area 2050. There are other um, participating or at least subscribing to city council and uh, transportation committee and sustainable transportation committee um, agendas so that you know what's going on. And like um, Peter said, if you just shoot an email to staff and um, the, the committee members, for instance, or to the clerk, the city or agency clerk, um, it's recorded and, and you're starting that dialogue. Um, which is really important so that they can start putting a name to um, your thoughts. Uh, and then if, when you have time, go and, and participate in the meetings that are public uh, whenever possible. There are public workshops and it's, um, such that you can participate in as well. And then, of course, you can volunteer and participate in the nonprofits um, that are listed and discussed in this room. And there are other ones, the, the bike coalitions that are around the Bay Area and many other organizations on, on sustainability and climate change uh, that you can become active in. And so um, invest some time, um, focus on the facts, and, um, and really um, enjoy your journey into part of advocacy, but also just being inspirational in your efforts to learn more and to keep others informed of um, public policy in the Bay Area. Thank you. Oh, and we should give everyone a big round of applause. Thank you. And um, just very, very brief, briefly, um, talking about ACT and public policy. Uh, so ACT is um, highly invested in public policy, both on the regional, or both on the federal and national level, and as well as in the local chapters. So um, I'm just going to bring up a little bit about the ACT Public Policy Committee, which meets monthly. Uh, and there are also public meetings every two months that are open to all ACT members. Uh, the committee provides updates on, for instance, the commuter benefits, the, the pre-tax commuter benefits that um, many employers provide. 
federal legislation that might impact you in your daily uh, lives, infrastructure bills, where does um, funding come from and where does it go to, uh, tax implications, which has been a big issue over the past couple of years for especially nonprofits, but also for for-profits. The ACT Public Policy and, and the ACT the organization is supported by Smith, Dawson, and Andrews, um, which is the public affairs uh, team. And, and so they're getting both the, the proper information um, about what's going on on the Hill, uh, and are also, they also have an op op opportu op sorry, opportunities to get to the Hill with matters in regards to TDM and mobility in general. Uh, ACT also puts together an annual legislative summit that some of you may have heard of. It's in DC, you have an opportunity to talk to your state representatives if, if um, that's something you're interested in. Right now in the last one, uh, it was focused on repeal of the unrelated business income tax, especially for nonprofits, and a proposed TDM legislation. So the problem is that on the federal level, there's no national recognition of TDM. So in the, the infrastructure budgets and um, uh, transportation policy in general, TDM is not recognized. So transportation demand management hasn't really been recognized by the general uh, uh, legislative body and, and everyone involved in Congress. So this um, uh, act put together a proposed TDM legislation and which was announced in April of 2019 that solidifies the importance and support of TDM as a key strategy for transpor federal transportation policy. And it reaches down all the way into our state level. And the title of this is More Through TDM and Mobility Options, Resiliency and Efficiency Through Transportation Demand Management Act. And you can find more information about this on ACT's website, and there's draft language provided, et cetera. It includes a definition, which is really important because when you talk about TDM, it's hard, sometimes hard to explain what it really means. And so there's a definition included, and it, if it is included in a future legislation, it would require regions to develop D, uh, TDM plans up as part of their long-range long planning, uh, planning efforts. There would also be oversight by advisory committees with representation from both the public and the private sector. So it's not only this um, um, just glossy TDM incorporation, it's actually gonna have impact on the inclusion of TDM in future uh, transportation um, bills. It would also establish a new annual $100 million funding source to support the implementation of these regional TDM plans. So if you're interested in learning more about the public policy efforts or the uh, TDM legislation, you also have a list here of ongoing issues that are being tracked. Um, feel free to visit ACT's website and learn more. And with that, the session is coming to an end. So I would like to thank everyone so much for coming out and for contributing to a really engaging conversation. A big round of applause to our speakers again. And also a big thanks to all the organizations who put on today's effort. It's, um, it's really um, fantastic to see that public policy is of interest to so many organizations and individuals. Uh, so let's give these organizations a round of applause as well.